Hello Solar Eclipse Timer users, this is Dr. Telepin again. As you prepare for a solar eclipse, you may hear or read a statement on the news like, eclipses make their own weather, but then you're left hanging for more solid information. Not much is said after that. Well, I'm going to give you some details about eclipse weather in general and some eclipse weather that I experienced and documented. Check it out. First contact in 60 seconds. We have to start by having a three-dimensional appreciation for what is going on during an eclipse and why there is even a possibility that it could affect weather. There is this huge column of a shadow passing from space through all layers of the Earth's atmosphere. Why is this important? Because since it is the shadow of the sun, it is lacking the sun's energy. Keep that point in mind. Now, we have to understand that the penumbra is huge. When preparing for an eclipse, we obviously get focused on the umbra because that is where we want to be. And all of the internet mapping sites show us this nice, well-defined umbra circle to help us position ourselves. That's fine and helpful, but it tends to make us lose sight of the big picture. Here is a satellite image of the shadow basically centered around Nashville. Now, to the proper scale, I am blending in the 71 mile diameter of the umbra. The umbra, where we need to be to see totality, is actually small compared to the penumbra. But the other point to keep in mind is that a large area just outside the umbra is still a fairly dark shadow. Look at the width of the complete penumbra in this animation. By the time the umbra hits the coast of Oregon, the penumbra is almost covering the entire continent of North America. Here's another NASA video of the path of the eclipse. This video demonstrates two things. First, because of the beautiful animations like this, we tend to think of the umbra as a sharply defined disk. Second, the penumbra is huge. I discussed this point in depth in another video called Eclipse in Universal Time. When I was in Tennessee, just witnessing first contact, the people on the coast of Oregon were just about to start totality. The penumbra stretched across the entire continent. I will put the link to that video below. Why is this important? Because we know that from the beginning of the penumbra to the umbra, there is a temperature gradient. As the shadow gets darker, the temperature becomes progressively cooler. It is significantly cooler when you get to totality. And even though the eclipse is moving along the ground at twice the speed of sound, directly blocking the sun during the duration of the shadow is powerful and decreases the temperature. This relatively rapid change in the temperature and solar energy does have an effect on local conditions as it passes. So when we want to discuss the statement, the eclipse can cause its own weather, we are basically referring to clouds, but there will be some other references to something that is unpredictable, and that is eclipse winds. So let's talk about that briefly. Frankly, the data and the reports about winds during an eclipse is so varied it's hard to draw any conclusions. There are reports of winds decreasing. This could certainly be related to the decrease in convective mixing of air as things cool in the layers closest to the ground. There are reports of breezes increasing, which could be related to cooler air rolling down sloping terrain. And there are plenty of reports of no change. I have never witnessed any wind effect myself, and what I just stated is really a summary of what has been written by Jay Anderson, an eclipse weather expert, and after reading his work, I believe it's safe to say that he is not convinced there is a relationship. The other unpredictable weather event is the creation of clouds. Can the cooler eclipse air actually cause the creation of clouds? I've only read about this one time, again by Jay Anderson, when he discussed it in an article, and he referred to a specific situation where there must have been enough moisture at the height where stratus clouds would be located, and the cooling air caused condensation at that level, creating stratus clouds before totality. So, 
there indeed can be conditions where the extra cooling of the eclipse can cause condensation and clouds. It requires perfect temperature and moisture conditions and the perfect height. For the same reasons, in morning eclipses, if the moisture conditions are right, fog can reform. Again, these are conditions that are not easily predictable. Jay Anderson is the true expert in eclipse weather and pre-eclipse weather predictions, and I refer you to his website. But the eclipse weather cloud event that is well understood and you are most likely to witness is the one that I witnessed at the 2017 eclipse. It is the dissipation of convective clouds as it cools. It is so amazing to see it happen. So let's go into that. Let's discuss the temperature drop again, because I want to change your focus a bit. Try to broaden your view of this and not just think of temperature. Think of the solar energy delivered to the ground surrounding you. This is a solar panel farm in Alabama. This is the power generation curve from these solar panels on Eclipse Day. Look at the drop in the electricity generation from C1 to 95% eclipse. The downward spikes after C4 are due to passing clouds. This is a curve of the decrease in solar energy, and this is the important component for discussing convective clouds, which are the type of clouds that an eclipse can affect. So to experience this effect, some details have to be met. You have to be positioned in the path where the eclipse is going to occur very late in the morning or early to mid-afternoon because you need to have enough time to generate convective clouds. To make convective clouds, the local conditions have to be right. It has to be a relatively clear morning, no storm fronts getting ready to move in, some moisture in the ground, and a warm enough temperature that the moisture can be released. So as the sun delivers energy to the Earth, approximately 50% is bounced off the atmosphere back to space, and approximately 50% of the energy is absorbed by land and water. Energy that reaches the surface heats the ground and begins the process of creating rising moist air. This air is in the form of invisible currents or eddies that rise, represented by the red spiral. And the rising eddies are balanced out by falling eddies of cooler air, represented by the blue spiral. Basically, your local area is in balance. As the sun gets higher in the sky, more energy is delivered and more moist air rises. The warm moist air rises until it gets to the level where it begins to condense and make light fluffy clouds. This is the beginning of the daily convective boundary layer. As the sun gets higher and higher, more energy is delivered and more clouds form. This is occurring from late morning to the afternoon. These are the convective clouds. They are formed by this motion of rising and falling air currents. If the day stays stable from a weather perspective, meaning no large fronts move in, this convection of energy happens all day until the late afternoon when the sun gets lower in the sky. Then less energy is delivered, the rising eddies slow down, the clouds are no longer fed with moisture, and they evaporate. This is why these convective clouds are said to be linked to the ground or have roots to the ground. These clouds are dependent on the energy delivered to the ground and the moisture from the ground. Now as eclipse chasers, we hate clouds, but it's important to understand this particular type of cloud because this type has less chance of obstructing your view of totality. Well, if you have these perfect conditions on eclipse day, what do you think happens? As the partial phases of the eclipse progress, it decreases the energy to the ground, and then, very close to second contact, the convective clouds will dissipate. You actually see it happen. Here's a picture on eclipse day, arriving to the site about 9 a.m., with second contact occurring at 2.32 p.m. Here are two pictures setting up at the site, both taken around 10 a.m. You see there's not a cloud in the sky. At 12.30, two hours before C2. This is a sequence of images panning from east to west. You can see the convective clouds that popped up. Notice they are more prominent to the south because our observing site was elevated on a small hill with a shallow valley to the south, which must have had more moisture to release. This image is facing west at 90 minutes before C2. 
we see convective clouds. This image is facing southeast at 45 minutes before C2. This image is facing south, also at 45 minutes before C2. This is a fisheye view of the sky directly over our observing site at 15 minutes before C2. This is a fisheye view directly over our observing site at the beginning of totality. The convective clouds clearly dissipated by the time the eclipse began. Now, the next interesting thing is that we have wonderful GOES satellite images from eclipse day that help us document what we observed on the ground. This is the GOES satellite loop centered over my observing site marked with a yellow circle. Watch as the umbra passes. Just before it gets dark, the clouds become less. And it's not just the decrease in the exposure of the image due to darkness. They have dissipated. This becomes more clear if you concentrate just to the right of my observing site as the umbra leaves. Do you see how there are no clouds there? The clouds were gone for totality. It then takes some time for the energy to recover and for the clouds to reappear. Now let me share some really interesting data with you. I am so fortunate to live close to Huntsville, Alabama and have the resources of Marshall Space Flight Center and the University of Alabama, Huntsville. UAH has a facility called SWIRL, which stands for Severe Weather Institute Radar and Lightning Laboratories. They have a lot of really cool gear and they deployed it to Western Kentucky for the eclipse. Dr. Kevin Knupp is the director of SWIRL and he was kind enough to meet with me discuss his data and allow me to share it with you. They have a system called a mobile Doppler LiDAR and sounding system. Basically what it does is measure the vertical velocity of the rising and falling eddies that we talked about earlier. I was totally blown away when I saw this data presented for the first time. This is real measurements of the eddies that I use the red and blue spirals to represent in my site energy drawings. The red lines represent rising vertical eddies and the blue lines falling vertical eddies. Then it gets really fascinating when you add the middle line for totality and add green lines that mark 50% obscuration before totality and 50% obscuration after totality. Before totality, look how the data on the vertical velocity of the eddies decreases right before totality. This demonstrates the decreasing delivery of solar energy and the decrease in the moisture that supplies the convective clouds. Remember the term root to the ground? After totality, look at the small delay for the energy to increase the eddies again. This vertical velocity data matches the GO satellite loop over the observation site. Here I have the satellite loop with the yellow circle marking the observation site and the vertical data beneath it. As the loop runs, look back and forth between the clouds forming and dissipating on the satellite and the vertical velocity eddies getting smaller and then increasing again in sequence with the umbra. It is amazing technology that correlates with the observations on the ground. So, let's review one final thing. This video would not be complete if we did not discuss the type of clouds that won't go away, the type that could block your view of the eclipse, and why you need to have plans to be mobile. First, when planning for an eclipse, if possible, you plan ahead weeks or months in advance and try to understand the basic directions of the weather fronts for the eclipse you are planning to observe. Then you pick a few observing sites along the path, hundreds of miles apart. Then about three to four days ahead of the eclipse, you begin to monitor the predicted weather fronts. Your goal is to be either well ahead of a front or just behind a passing front on eclipse day. You are trying to put yourself in a bubble of high pressure. So, for the 2017 eclipse across the United States, here is the satellite on eclipse day. The country was pretty clear except for some major problems over Missouri and moderate problems over South Carolina. So if you are planning ahead correctly for this eclipse and you are originally planning to observe in Missouri, the weather prediction models would have shown this low pressure front moving in the middle of the country at least 36 hours in advance. Here's the satellite loop and I have overlaid the path. So your strategy would be to drive through the front 
and get to the path on the west side of the front where it would be clear behind the front for eclipse day, like getting to western Nebraska or Wyoming, or drive far enough east on the path to be ahead of the front on eclipse day, like getting to Illinois or Kentucky. Folks on the coast of South Carolina would need to plan to move west in their state or even go to Tennessee. So that is always the basic weather plan. First, look at the historical cloud prediction data. Second, watch the moving weather fronts starting three to four days before the eclipse and make a final decision about 36 hours before the eclipse. Clouds like seen here in Missouri and South Carolina are not going to clear due to the decrease in solar energy. In addition, on eclipse day, if your observing site starts off clear, but then it looks like clouds are forming that look thicker than light convective clouds, meaning they are getting really dense and starting to get a gray bottom, these are also going to be too dense to dissipate by totality. So you have a decision to make. Stay put and hope totality occurs within a gap in the clouds, or quickly try to drive to a position that looks more clear of thick clouds. Thank you for watching this Solar Eclipse Timer episode. I hope you found this episode on eclipse weather, clouds, and weather planning helpful and interesting. If you like this type of eclipse information, click the subscribe button below. Also click the little bell that will pop up. That will make sure you are notified when I release new episodes about solar eclipses. Share the video with friends and post comments and questions. If you don't feel like subscribing now, that's fine. Just check in on this channel. My goal is to make this channel the best solar eclipse resource on the internet. Thanks again. I appreciate your time.